Welcome to the Bookman's Corner. I'm your host, Lois Lindstrom. There have been at least 21 deadly mass shootings in the United States this year, and that's the count as of mid-November 2019. Back on April 16, 2007, 32 Virginia Tech students and professors were murdered. Then the nation's deadliest mass shooting by a lone gunman, the tragedy sparked an international debate on gun culture in the United States and safety on college campuses. Yet since 2007, large-scale gun violence has continued at a horrifying pace. We are pleased to have with us today author and journalist Tom Capsidelis, who wrote the book After Virginia Tech, Guns, Safety, and Healing in the Era of Mass Shootings. Welcome to our show, Tom. Lois, thanks so much for having me it's here today. It's great to have you here. Uh, our viewers should know that Tom was a fellow at Virginia Humanities and worked as an editor at the Richmond Times-Dispatch for 28 years. In this book, Tom examines the experiences of survivors and, com and community members who have advocated for reforms in gun safety, campus security, trauma recovery, and mental health. There's a crowded book market out there on gun safety and mental health. So what led you to write this book on the Virginia Tech massacre? Lois, I was the uh, editor in charge of the coverage of the shootings at Virginia Tech uh, for my newspaper, the Richmond Times-Dispatch. Um, I arrived in Blacksburg about 4 p.m. that afternoon and stayed there the first few days with uh, reporters and photographers uh, from the newspaper. We edited the stories in Blacksburg and sent them back to Richmond. Uh, that experience for me um, was uh, indelible and uh, over time I came to um, become close to the notion that there was a, a large story to be written, a book that could be written about how survivors were moving forward uh, at a time of a very divisive gun debate in Virginia as well. Mm, it's a very good point. I mean, I mean, while uh, there have been calls for new federal legislation on guns, including a proposal for greater background checks and a ban on assault weapons, and all that has gone nowhere, do you expect Congress to do more on gun control in 2020? You know, even as we even as we meet today, uh, there are stories written about what the prospects are for that. The U.S. House of Representatives has passed a universal background check bill, uh, which is uh, sitting in the office of Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Um, the politics right now are very turbulent. It's difficult to say uh, what may happen in 2020. Hmm, that's interesting. Well, I mean, corporations such as Walmart, where an, an El, El Paso, Texas store was the site of a shooting in August that left 22 people dead, uh, has taken action on guns. I mean, what have they done? Walmart, Walmart decided it would not sell any weapon to anyone younger than 21 years old. That's so, good. Some time back, Walmart also decided it would not sell assault weapons in its stores, as did uh, Dick's Sporting Goods, which also uh, raised the minimum, which also raised the minimum age. At the same time, many retailers uh, have spoken out about concealed carry in their stores and have asked some of their has have asked their customers uh, to refrain from bringing the guns into their establishments. So the business community has also uh, looked to gun safety and gun reform as issues as issues in which they want to be involved. That, that's very positive. Well, I, I remember the, the, the Sandy Hook killer, Adam Lanza, was 20 when he shot and killed his mother at home and then gunned down 26 first graders and, and the teachers at Sandy Hook Elementary in Newtown, Connecticut in 2012. Um, did any gun control legislation come about as a result of this awful shooting? The United States Senate failed to pass universal background checks bill in after the Sandy Hook shootings, uh, as well as other gun safety measures. Mm -hmm. Since then, uh, Connecticut and some other states have ta taken action on their own. Uh, there was a great disappointment uh, that no federal action was taken after Sandy Hook, but gun safety advocates, uh, some say that, that that's the beginning of their fight, and they, don't, they refuse to see that as the end. Mm, good, good. Well, this, this, this interview with, with you is very timely because a U.S. Supreme Court action in, 20, in November of 2019 allows a lawsuit filed by parents of Sandy Hook Elementary School victims to move forward at their state level on the allegation that Remington Arms marketed the military-style rifle used in that military shooting, in that mass shooting, for use in assaults against human beings. I mean, can you tell us more? That case is being watched very closely <clears throat> because what it shows, it shows a path 
force suit against gun manufacturers, which are, who are largely immune from those types of suits through a law that was passed in 2005. But this, uh, this shows a way that a, gun a suit against gun manufacturers can be uh, taken to court on the argument that the weapon was irresponsibly marketed towards at-risk uh, in a way that uh, made it appealing to at-risk uh, young men. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, the FBI doesn't have an official definition for a mass shooting, but describes a mass killing as an incident in which three or more people, not including the shooter or, or the, uh, the suspected shooter, are killed. Uh, what do you think of this definition of mass shooting? There are a number of, <clears throat> there are a number of different ways that mass shootings can be, um, can be tabulated. Um, I think it's important to understand also, though, that uh, no matter what the number is, whether it's three or four, um, or more that many of the same safety strategies uh, and, and proposals that are being advocated not only address mass shootings but the uh, violence that strikes our communities every day and perhaps doesn't get as much attention. Well, don't you think the FBI should have a, an official definition of this? Yes, and, 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 it, uh, and it does, yes. It, it, okay, so that, that is the official definition then for the, for the FBI for a, mass, for a mass shooting then. It's three or more killed, right? That's a mass killing? Yes. Okay. Um, I read in your book that, Virginia, uh, that the Virginia Tech student, Song Hu Chu, who murdered 27 students and five teachers and wounded 17 others, has attended, had attended schools in Fairfax County but had frightened um, students in his college English class with his dark writing and bizarre behavior. I mean, can you tell our viewers about the lawsuit that was brought against, against Virginia Tech for failing to give a timely warning about um, the, the shooter, uh, this Virginia Tech student who killed so many on the campus on uh, April 16, 2007? Two parents who did not participate in the state settlement with the other families uh, uh, brought suit against uh, the university, uh, and that case went to trial. And they won a, they won a judgment in Montgomery County Circuit Court, the county in which uh, mm -hmm. Virginia Tech is located, uh, that Virginia Tech should have given a more timely notice of the first shootings. Two students were fatally shot in the dormitory uh, early in the morning before, before the shooter returned to campus uh, and committed the mass shootings in Norris Hall, the, class, in the, the classroom building. Uh, that suit was later overturned, uh, some technical decision by the Virginia Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the university did pay a federal fine for failing to make a timely notice. Well, it was a, it was a pretty huge amount of money, though, what, what, that, the, that the parents received, didn't they? I mean, what, wasn't wasn't it uh, uh, like uh, was it like going to be hundred thousand dollars or something like that? Or? The the award in the award in Montgomery County Circuit Court was much larger, but it was eventually reduced. It was like it was like three million, I think. It was I mean, two or three million dollars, and then they reduced it. Yeah. It was and it was reduced because of the cap on liability against the state. Wow, wow. The students from the Virginia Tech shooting in the 2007 uh, in 2007 were diagnosed with um, PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder. Uh, it, th this is usually associated with re uh, returning veterans of war. I mean, describe that problem and tell us where did the affected students find therapy for that disorder and how long were they coping with that problem, the Virginia Tech students? For some, it became immediately apparent. Others uh, suffered uh, PTSD for years before they, rec before they recognized it in themselves and, and sought treatment. Uh, now, what, 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 what is it like to have that, um, that disorder? What, what, do you, what, 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 what are the uh, symptoms of it? I think that um, when someone has uh, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, after surviving a mass shooting, uh, there are many uh, reminders uh, that take place day to day. Um, the configuration of a room that you might be in as being similar to where you were where the shooting occurred, uh, loud noises. So that, you have high anxiety then. Right? Mm, yeah. Loud noises, um, flashbacks to uh, flashbacks to that day, um, any number of uh, any number of uh, reminders that that make life very difficult. Mm -mm -mm. And and how do you think the gun safety movement changed since the students from Florida's Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, became active? and media savvy after the mass shooting there in 2018. I mean, can you tell us how their actions changed gun laws? They, 
they immediately they immediately got out to work on the gun safety movement. And as you say, uh, so much of our media has changed over the years. Um, uh, strategies that weren't available to some of the Virginia Tech uh, community members in 2007. 2007 was the year of the first iPhone. Right. The Marjorie Stoneman Douglas students uh, mobilized. They had unity, and they made uh, they made use of the technology to get their word out. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, I interviewed some of the Virginia Tech survivors who said they saw themselves in the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas movement, and really? and that uh, wished them, uh, w of course, wished them all the best success, uh, uh, but also being aware that it's a long road to achieve, uh, long road to achieve reforms. Yes. And, and of course, after the students uh, uh, energized the political, uh, a political debate in 2018, we did see a, a change in the U.S. House of Representatives there as well. Mm. And then uh, regarding uh, that same high school in Parkland, Florida, the father of Meadow Pollock, a student who was killed, wrote a book, Why Meadow Died, and his take was that the, student, that the student who killed his daughter was an angry, emotional boy who threatened fellow students and teachers, but the policy at the high school was not to suspend really disruptive kids. I mean, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School did not report any disciplinary reports about this student, therefore he was able to purchase a gun. I mean, uh, the school had not reported uh, that the, the student threw desks and pulled fire alarms and talked about guns constantly. I mean, should very disruptive and emotionally disturbed students be allowed to be mainstreamed into public schools? That's really a, that's really a difficult question. There are so many different circumstances, and there and all of these cases are are very different. Uh, I would say that mental illness and mental health problems are not an indicator of violence, and in fact, uh, people with mental health problems are more likely to become the victim of a violent a violent act. Um, what uh, experts say. Uh, should be looked for um, are, are signs that uh, someone is contemplating a violent act, um, things that they have said, actions that it, actions that they have taken. Yes, well, it's 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 getting so worrisome. You, you, we have so many reports of students being killed in our schools. It's, it's just we're just so uh, concerned about this. Um, you wrote that uh, one of the, the wounded students at Virginia Tech, um, Colin Goddard, became an activist and joined the ba Brady campaign to prevent gun violence. Um, and then, of course, James Brady was Ronald Reagan's press secretary who was shot in Washington, D.C. in 1981 when he accompanied the President Reagan, who was also shot. And, Bra and Brady's injuries were terrible, and his wife um, started the Brady campaign. Um, well, Colin Goddard's story was featured in a film, and, and you write about this in your book. I thought that was interesting. Yes, Colin Goddard was featured in a documentary called Living for 32, that in which he uh, talks about his experiences as a survivor and uh, features him connecting with other survivor communities and um, talking about uh, reductions in gun violence. And this is really... Uh, an example of one of the uh, uh, fascinating uh, outreaches of the Virginia Tech survivors, how many other survivor communities they've become a part of and how they've helped one another while trying to energize people on the notion of, of supporting gun safety, trauma recovery. You talked about you were um, at your church and, and people came up to you about this book and about, about their concern about the Virginia Tech students. And could you just tell our viewers about how you experienced how, how much people are concerned about gun violence? People are very much concerned about um, the Virginia Tech community. Of course, being in Virginia, we're exposed to that, uh, we're expo we're exposed to that much more directly. But I took great encouragement uh, in the research and the writing of the book by meeting so many people who had a, a deep and abiding connection to the community. In many instances, um, through a second or third degree of separation, of course, uh, it's such a large school with so many yes. uh, graduates in Virginia and such a, a profound influence over our state, but also uh, people who had really no prior connection and not only were uh, concerned about uh, the path forward by the survivors, but remembered individual uh, victims and wanted to know uh, how the families were doing and wanted to hear more about what the efforts were to achieve reforms. Yes, and that's so positive. And I also liked your chapter in the book, uh, which is titled, When Police Call for Help, because 
Uh, I was curious, why did you include this chapter? Uh, I think people forget that police and first responders are often hurt and emotionally distraught after these mass killings, and they are seeking solutions uh, in a bottle or a can or a pill. I mean, it must be hard to shoot down the door and see lying, kids lying dead and injured all over the place. I mean, that must be hard. <laughs> One of the one of the one of the most lasting uh, institutions for reform that's been established after Virginia Tech is the Virginia Law Enforcement Assistance Program, uh, which was started by uh, two police chaplains uh, to to the Blacksburg Police Force, and a and an officer there um, who is now retired. And together they formed an organization uh, that. Uh, addresses the PTSD of officers, uh, creates seminars where they can come together, discuss their experiences, and it's police, uh, it's police helping police. And this grew out of their experiences uh, helping the officers in the immediate aftermath of the shootings at Virginia Tech. I don't think the public knows this. I, I think it's, that's new. And not every state has this type of organization, mm -hmm. and so not only has the Virginia Law Enforcement Assistance Program helped hundreds of officers from Virginia, but also officers from other states, including Connecticut. Fantastic. Well, it was interesting to read that some of the survivors of Virginia Tech um, uh, went on to, um, when they came back to Virginia Tech, they had a hard time establishing where they would sit in the classroom. I mean, they were looking at each classroom with the idea of where, the, where should they be in case uh, someone starts shooting. I mean, is there a safe place to be in a classroom, do you think? I think you could ask that question about about any about any uh, public place where we any public place uh, where we can gather, um, movie theaters, classrooms. Uh, sadly, we have to all um, we have to all now have more awareness of uh, where exits are and, and of being and of being safe. So it's it is a it was a sad reality for the students who went back and were contemplating that. Under the stress of having, that's right. Of, 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 of studying and, and learning, they have to figure out where's the exit, right? <laughs> and, it's, and, and mm -hmm. under the stress of being survivors, and yeah. to and to have to contemplate that. But for all of us, for, but for all of us now, certainly um, mm. we are all thinking in more awareness. Well, that you know, it was shocking. To, it was shocking to read how difficult it was for the parents who drove from many different states to Blacksburg, Virginia, to check on their children who were attending Virginia Tech during this horrible shooting incident in 2007. I mean, why were there, there delays in getting information to the parents about their kids? And why did it take the university so long to issue an alert after more than two people had been mortally wounded on the Virginia Tech campus? Um, it's really kind of a, a two-part question. The, um, the yeah. mechanism and uh, center for, for notifying uh, the parents uh, became quickly overwhelmed night after the shootings mm -hmm. um, uh, there were there were efforts made uh, but that simply uh, simply uh, was overwhelmed that night as the medical examiner's office was overwhelmed that night um, that there were in the governor's report uh, that studied the aftermath of the shootings uh, steps were laid out as to how that could be better handled in the future um, the university um, did not issue a timely warning as we've discussed, did not issue a timely warning as mm. we've discussed okay. earlier. Yeah. Um, they um, said there were steps that they had to go through to uh, notify the parents, uh, family members of the f in, through the first shooting, but it's clear that uh, those discussions likely went on too long. Yes, yes. And then you wrote that, you wrote in your book that terms like mass shooter, active shooter, and threat assessment have come to the fore in our new era. I mean, one in which per perpetrators of, of explicable crimes often es escape accountability through their own suicides but leave lifelong challenges for survivors and their families. I mean, how are the students who were hurt at the Virginia Tech mass shooting in 2007, how are they doing now? One of the uh, somewhat unknown uh, facts about the aftermath of the shootings is that all the students who were physically injured did return to Virginia Tech and graduated from there. They all uh, did. Yes, wow. and there, there is a. It's. I'm not able to say, uh, to speak for all of the. Uh, f I'm not able to speak for all of the injured survivors and how they're doing today. Um, but it's a very close knit group, and I know they have um, support from one another and from their friends, family, and community. That's, that's so good. That's so good. Remember the, the the shooting at Columbine High School in 1999. 
Uh, do you think that that mass shooting started the school mass shooting phenomenon in our country? I think people look at it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way that is, uh, I think people look at it in, a, in, in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, some people go farther back to the uh, University of Texas shootings in, in 1966. Um, these are all tragic incidents and uh, tragic, um, tragic, tragic events. Um, whether, it, whether that was the start or not, or whether the University of Texas is considered by some as the start, um, people all look at these as a way to um, s study from the history and to, to learn what took place and how mm -hmm. improvements can be made. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, it was interesting to read in your book that crime trends and politics change, and homicides in the Richmond area approached an all-time low from their spike during the cocaine era of the 1990s. There were 160 homicides in 1994, but in 2014 there were 42. Um, what, uh, what is your take on this? There are many factors uh, associated with the decline in homicides, not only in Richmond, uh, but in other communities. Um, but any number of homicides is too many, and even as we've seen um, an upturn in homicides uh, in our communities uh, and in public places, uh, we, uh, we shouldn't let our guard down, that, uh, that we should not be satisfied with any level of homicide. Uh, exactly, homicides. exactly, exactly. And I found it interesting that you, you write um, uh, that gun claims are good for the fact-checking business. You wrote, wrote that polit PolitiFacts, founded by the Tampa Bay Times, lists pages of gun assertions it, it, it has analyzed and graded, noting mistaken claims on both sides. I mean, can you give us a couple of examples of that? Well, I think the, I think the, I think the gun debate, uh, like many of our political debates, is uh, unduly influenced by a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, loose arguments. The arguments are loosely based on fact rather, being, rather than being fact-driven. We talked earlier about mm -hmm. how uh, the misconception that diagnosed mental illness is the chief cause of, uh, of gun violence in our country and that if we could um, fix everything that's wrong with the mental health system, then we would have a, a great reduction in mass shootings. Um, and the statistics don't... The, the, statistics, the statistics don't, the statistics don't uh, bear that out. Okay. Um, we have uh, too many guns in our country, uh, too easy, uh, yes. too easy of access to guns. But getting back to your point about the, uh, getting back to your point about the different claims, um, it's also something as simple as uh, the statement that gun safety uh, legislation is a is an erosion of a constitutional right. When the U.S. Supreme Court uh, greatly expanded the rights of gun owners in the 2008 Heller decision, it allowed room. Uh, for regulation, and even uh, Justice Scalia wrote that uh, that regulation is is allowed. Mm, that's really interesting, and um, I, I, I thought it was also in your in your book you have a chapter uh, titled "Quiet Qu Carry," and and Nick Rowland said he was only 21 at the time of the Tech shootings, and shortly afterwards obtained a permit for concealed carry in his native state of Tennessee. Can you tell us more about concealed carry? What do you think? What are your views on that? After the Virginia Tech shootings, there was a move. There was more of a movement to allow the uh, carrying of concealed weapons on campuses across the country. Uh, this did not become law uh, in Virginia. It has become law in a few states, uh, most notably recently uh, in Texas, where the law uh, took effect in 1966. Well, this is probably because people feel like, well, if I have if I have a hidden gun and someone charges into the classroom, I can maybe pull it out and kill that person, right? In other words, it's like it's like the old it's like the old West, right? I mean, if everyone has if everyone has a gun. In, uh, or, or a concealed weapon, and and some and a lunatic, t you know, blast in through the classroom, and may maybe that person feels that they can defend the people that are there. Do, do you think that's a an issue? That's that's an argument that's been made. But police will also say that when they go into a, a, a scene of gun violence, um, that they it's difficult to tell. If, if there are many armed people, it will be difficult to tell who is the perpetrator and who is the person who's trying to, and who is the person who's trying to protect the others. Uh, also, uh, we have seen instances where uh, people have been uh, shot by mistake or nearly shot by mistake, and of course, um, 
these mass shootings and homicides in our neighborhoods uh, take place within a very short period of time. Exactly, and of course with guns, it, it, like anything else, you have to be practicing, practicing, practicing to be, to be, to be able to aim well, right? I mean, it's, it's like, in other words, you can't just be, have a gun and not know how, not, not be trained to use it. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a weapon, isn't it? Police have a great deal of training and can and exactly. speak authoritatively about that. Exactly. Um, and then, um, you know, I found it interesting to read uh, that the residents in New Jersey want more gun control, according to a new poll, and there is a list of various gun control measures that they, that they like. Uh, new Jersey residents are supportive of more funding for mental health care services, mandatory background checks for potential gun owners, laws that allow guns to be taken from people that are considered dangerous by the police, a nationwide ban on assault weapons, and a nationwide ban on ammunition clips with more than 10 bullets. And do you think that the residents of Virginia would support stricter gun laws like that? The, the polls show that uh, Virginians are interested in stricter gun laws. There's uh, large support for universal background checks, uh, other measures. In fact, a Washington Post poll taken before um, the Virginia elect legislative elections of this past November uh, showed that many voters consider it to be a top issue. And, uh, and a, so do you think that, um, that things are changing politically because of this issue? I mean, in Virginia, there's been some changes, right? And yes, and in Virginia, the Democrats have seized control of the of the Senate and the House of Delegates, uh, united behind uh, Governor Northam's push for some of these gun safety um, legislation that we've just uh, that we've just talked about. Of course, Governor Northam um, called the legislature back into session during the summer after the mass shootings in Virginia Beach uh, to consider gun safety legislation. The Republicans, who then held narrow majorities in the House and the Senate, uh, shut down the, se the special session within uh, 90 minutes. That became an issue during the campaigns, very much so. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I, um, it, so your, your, your feeling is that residents of Virginia are supporting stricter gun control measures, and, and so, we'll, so the future is going to be pretty, go that direction in your view, right? I think that could take place, yes. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tom, thank you so much for being a guest on our program today. Our, our, our time in the, in the studio has come to a close, but I know we could spend another 30 or 40 minutes talking about this book. And um, where, uh, my big question is, where can our viewers find your book to purchase it? Uh, my book is for sale at Politics and Prose in the Washington area, uh, Barnes & Noble, uh, through my publisher, uh, the University of Virginia Press, and it's also available on Amazon. Fantastic. Thank, and again, thank you so much for being on our program. Lois, thank you for having me on the program it's, today. It's been great. Thanks for watching. Please join us again next month for a new edition of the Bookman's Corner. I'm Lois Lindstrom.